This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Lauren Nordgren, who is a professor of management at the uh, Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. And he is also the author of, co author of this book right here, The Human Element Overcoming the Resistance That Awaits New Ideas. Um, so, Lauren, look, you're, you're in the management department. And you're writing a book about kind of, I guess you could say it's about convincing, persuading, selling, motivating, getting people to adopt uh, new ideas. And, you know, what I found interesting about this is that, um, you know, we typically think about selling, marketing, persuading. It's, it's really, you know, usually in the context of getting people to, you know, buy, buy a product, buy some new product. But you're, you're talking about getting people to kind of buy into new ideas. And this, this, I can think of it as sort of marketing internally in a way, uh, although a lot of what you're talking about is also related to getting people to, you know, adopt a new way of doing things uh, as customers. Um, and you set up this dichotomy between kind of fuel and fiction. And uh, I mean, fuel and friction, <laughs> we'll have to dig into this. Um, but you, you kind of argue that most motivational and persuasive techniques that people are exposed to in business school and elsewhere really dig into this whole idea of fuel, right? If you just make a persuasive case, you provide, um, you know, all the reasons why you ought to do something, all the reasons why you want to adapt some, something that, you know, the logic of that argument, uh, and the power of that argument ought to ultimately prevail. And, and, and you point out that, uh, there's a countervailing force you call friction, which is, um, has to be addressed. And it's actually a lot stronger than most people give it credit for. Uh, and the whole book is really about articulating the sources of these frictions and, and how you can kind of overcome them. So first of all, um, you know, did you come at this primarily from the angle of, you know, innovation and thinking about how organizations, you know, need, need to innovate, uh, or did you come at it more from like the, uh, I don't know, organizational behavior side of things? How did you kind of get into this, this topic, which covers so many different disciplines really? Yeah. Um, well, I am interested in in change, and I think, uh, in particular, I'm interested in <clears throat> how why is it that we often see uh, good ideas get rejected? Why do we see better paths never materialize? But for me, this is very broadly construed. So, as you point out, it, different people kind of bring their own uh, assumptions around the focus, and and so this. Um, marketing and sales is a place where we are trying to pitch new ideas, but in uh, in organizations, we're trying to maybe bring, um, create new change initiatives. Uh, these ideas, I apply them as a, much to social innovation and change, but really for me, the uh, I'm happy to <clears throat> put this concept into almost any con context that is really thinking about um, the f uh, that is thinking about bringing new ideas to life, whether that be business, whether that be social, really any of those contexts. Right. And so, you know, a lot of management folks and strategy folks talk about this kind of explore versus exploit trade-off. And, you know, when the world is kind of moving relatively slowly, then, you know, there's a premium on kind of, you know, execution and efficiency and kind of rinse, wash, repeat. And, the moments when you have to actually disrupt that equilibrium are relatively few and far between. But in today's world, right, you know, you're almost continually engaged in some kind of change management. I remember one, one person I had to speak in my class said that all, all management is now change management, right? Is, is that why sort of, you know, we're devoting so much more attention to to this? I mean, persuasion and has always been important, but is, is persuasion around new things, you know, different in some qualitative way from just persuasion around kind of, you know, whatever negotiations, kind of getting what you want and so forth. Well, yeah, I, I think uh, in this moment in time in particular, you are seeing um, both a lot of change, but also a lot of opportunity for change. And, and some, some, some individuals, some leaders, some organizations will have the capacity to grasp it and, and others uh, will not. And, and perhaps for that reason, you were saying uh, uh, such an emphasis or there's such an appetite to uh, think about this process. Um, in, 
I, I think what focuses people's attention on it is that so often they can identify uh, a tangible path but it feels like the things that hold them back from achieving it this better way often have little to do with the thing itself, but it's the tradition, it's the mindset, it's these, and which is why the book is called the human element. It's these kind of human factors that often kind of get in the way um, uh, of, of achieving this, even if it is an unquestionably uh, better thing. So you, you mentioned at the beginning of the book, you talk about kind of the, the default to, to fuel, right? <laughs> default. So wh wh where does that come from? I mean, uh, if, if in fact, kind of inertia and resistance to change is, is, is um, you know, is human and uh, is, is pervasive, why, why are we so oblivious to it, right? Why is it that we default to the thing which is perhaps, you know, least effective or at least yeah. Why do we overestimate the efficacy of our of our fuel based arguments and fuel based initiatives? Yeah. So, um, let me talk a little bit about this kind of first this concept of thinking in fuel fuel based mindset, and then uh, get into I think there's a couple of reasons why. So, um, the the book opens with. Uh, this experiment that I've been doing for a little while that I think really nicely captures this idea. Um, so uh, I ask people, um, my co-author and I, David, we've probably posed this question to thousands of people at this point, but we tell them about a little bit about the performance elements of a, of a bullet. And in particular, we show them a rifle cartridge and we talk about how this thing, you know, this technologically simple device, it breaks the sound barrier, you know, it's, it travels at something like 1300 feet per second, per second, uh, it can travel nearly two miles. Uh, and it is over, you know, three, four, 500 yards, a bullet like that can strike a very small target with pinpoint accuracy, a pretty incredible thing. And uh, a question, a very simple question we pose to a lot of people is, well, what is it that enables a bullet, a bullet to do that? And when you pose that question to people, you will find that there is a default, a reflexive answer, and the answer they give is gunpowder. Uh, and the reason they say gunpowder is because <clears throat> when a bullet uh, ignites, when gunpowder ignites, that gunpowder expands. It creates a gas that expands creating tremendous pressure inside the barrel of a, of a gun or a rifle. And the only way for that pressure to be relieved is to push the bullet out the end. Uh, so gunpowder isn't the wrong answer to that question, but of course it's a, it's a deeply, woefully incomplete answer. And it's an incomplete answer because anytime an object takes flight, be it a plane, be it a bullet, whatever it is, you, we can think of two opposing forces. There are the forces that fuel this thing, that propel it forward. In the case of a plane, it's an engine. In the case of a bullet, it is gunpowder. But there are also forces that get in the way. There are forces that oppose that progress. Uh, namely, these are things like gravity and wind resistance. And for a bullet, the big one is wind resistance or drag. And that's because the faster something moves, the more drag it encounters. And um, I assume every listener can think of that childhood moment of putting their arm out the window on the highway, right? That feeling, that's drag. And what's interesting about drag, the more speed you give to something, the greater the drag. So if we add more gunpowder, we are simply mm. creating uh, more mm -hmm. resistance. So yes, gunpowder explains that initial velocity, but the reason, uh, an, equal, uh, uh, an equally good answer and an equally essential part of that equation is that the reason a bullet is able to fly so far, so true, is that it has been optimized to reduce those frictions. Like so much, every element of its design, you know, if, if, if you, uh, anyone who's got experience with these things will know what a drag coefficient is on a bullet. This is all designed to work against uh, wind resistance or drag. And it's a very nice analogy for what we see in 
the kind of business challenges, whether it's sales, whether it's internal change, um, people tend to operate on this idea that the way you get people to embrace new ideas is by uh, elevating the attraction or the appeal. And I, we lose- This would be like adding, adding, this is basically like adding, adding, adding more gunpowder. It's like adding more gunpowder. So, you know, how do we get people, why aren't they buying our product? Well, maybe uh, we need to refine the label and that elevates punch, that elevates fuel. Um, maybe we need to uh, refine our pitch. Maybe we need to have a better showroom experience. Maybe we need to add new features. Like we have this reflexive idea that the way you get someone to say yes is to elevate appeal, magnetism, attraction. And we intuitively think that if people are rejecting our offering, it's because that fuel is insufficient. And we refer to that reflex as thinking in fuel or a fuel based mindset. And again, fuel is very important. We have departments and companies, you know, the marketing department, the HR department, a lot of those things in, in their own ways are devoted to creating fuel. But um, the, the basic proposition is that in, in fixating on that element, that very important element, we miss an equally important element, which is what are these generally psychological forces that are opposing right the kind of psychological forces that are like gravity and wind resistance that get in um the way and i'm sure we'll get into what those are and how they operate but why do people tend to think this way um th there are a couple reasons and uh the first is uh it's one of the the classic findings of psychology uh which is my background and it is uh, it's often called the fundamental attribution error. And it, the, all that that means is that we tend to explain action and behavior in terms of internal forces like motivation and intent. So I think the angry driver is an easy one, uh, is an easy example. So you imagine you're on the highway and a driver cuts you off, driving rudely, recklessly, et cetera. You know, think about what your automatic attribution as explanation you know you probably think oh that driver is a jerk or whatever your term would be for that moment but think of i could think of more colorful salient. descriptions me too me too me too but uh, out of sensitivity <laughs> to our audience but think about like what we don't think about what you what's probably much less accessible if it occurs to you at all is some situational element like maybe that driver has a full bladder now, this habit of explaining things in terms of intent and motivation that perfectly maps onto a fuel-based mindset, right? So um, why aren't people buying our product? Well, they must, excitement must be insufficient. Uh, why don't young people vote? Oh, because of political apathy. Like we naturally uh, interpret behavior or the mm -hmm. lack of behavior in terms of motivation, intent, and if that's the attribution we form, well, how do you solve that problem? We, well, fuel does that job. Oh, so people aren't buying our new product because of a lack of excitement. Well, what do we do? We better elevate excitement, elevate magnetism, and mm -hmm. fuel does that job. Uh, so this attribution style, I think, is a very big reason for us having a fuel-based mindset. I think another in, in, uh, second reason is that we tend to focus on the the action, the innovation, and not the audience, right? So if your product mm. is struggling, all our fixation is naturally on the thing itself and how do we make this thing better. Uh, what we tend to, th most of the frictions that, I'm, that we'll explore are less about the thing and more about the audience or more about the rich context. And that's a, that's an important thing to understand, but it's also a harder thing to understand because it tends to require perspective taking. It, re it tends to require empathy in the sense of maybe not sympathy, but really understanding. Um, and, and that's just a harder process. And so I think that's another reason why we tend to think about solving change problems really in terms of fuel and not about the frictions, understanding these barriers that get in the way.
Now, to be clear, when you talk about fuel, you, you, there's two. It's not just simply about um, stimulating desire or, you know, making the case for why you ought to do something right. You know, there's also, you know, aversive fuel, right? Like creating fear or creating, you know, uh, threat or, you know, awareness of, of, of loss, right? Those are those, those kind of negative affect motivators can, can also be a, a form of, of fuel, right? So if, if, for instance, you mentioned this case where you say, um, only three rooms left, right, on, you know, Expedia, you know, that, that's supposed, that's also a type of, of fuel or, you know, FOMO, FOMO is, is a, is a fuel, right? Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a really important point. So we tend to think about fuel as these positive things, but the, the, the job of fuel is to simply ignite or incite our desire for change. And we often do that by dangling shiny things in front of people. Um, so carrots, but we also use sticks. And so that kind of, yeah, the, the telling people, this is a limited opportunity. There's only one left. That's, that is inciting desire for change. It's not making it necessarily more fun, more pleasant, more intrinsically interesting. But really anything that propels, uh, whether that's a push or a pull, we would consider fuel. So I, I, find, I, I like the analogies that you're making to kind of human factors, right? So in engineering schools uh, for a long time, you know, they, would, they wouldn't teach human factors. And now it's oftentimes kind of a little, it's like a little add-on. It's like, well, look, you know, it, if, if somebody's not using your remote control, it's not you know, user error, it's maybe engineer error, right? And, and this was kind of a, this is pretty, you know, this is a pretty major improvement. <laughs> it's a serious development, but it's still kind of an afterthought in many kind of engineering schools. And, you know, now in, in, in business schools and engineering schools, we have, you know, design thinking and, and customer journey mapping. And we try to promote this whole idea of, you know, becoming like an ethnographer or an anthropologist, right? Uh, or, or, or is this whole kind of, you know, movement to, staple on empathy to um, design and business, really a, a, a movement to stimulate awareness around what, what you call uh, friction? Um, yeah, I, uh, I agree with the, with the, with your depiction of this both growing interest and awareness of, of the importance of understanding, empathy, perspective taking, um, but also that is often doesn't have a, a, the main seat at the table. Um, and yeah. uh, so when people, you know, anytime- So it's kind of like an add-on or it's, it's like stapled on to the, it's like, a, it's a, oh yeah, right now let's just do a little bit of this stuff at, at, at the end of the, at the in, end of the process. It, in many cases, I think it still may have that role. I think in our particular case, what, what I, I think what we would say is even when you do the ethnography, even when you, um, you know, it's like in our Kellogg marketing, when you, that's very focused on the person. Um, but what element of that are we focused on? And even there, in our experience, the natural focus is going to be it's all going to derive from this basic assumption that my job here is to figure out how to elevate appeal. My job is to figure out mm -hmm. how to enhance excitement. Um, and what gets often no or very little attention is really thinking about, well, what, like, let's, ass this is one of my favorite thought experiments, um, is let's assume they really love this idea. Like the idea itself is one that they're comfortable with. And if you hold, if you make that assumption, then you have to begin to, to ask, then what, w they like the idea, but there are some barriers here. And it's the, in fact, it's the barriers that are holding people back from embracing the change. What would those barriers be? So, it, so in my experience, I love, if not, I, I love anything that has um, a, that is human centered in its approach, but you can even, but you can take that approach and still neglect this side of the experience where mm. you, you can still come into it thinking, oh, my job is I'm, as I'm using these 
techniques, these interviewing techniques, et cetera, to figure out how to enhance excitement rather than trying to unlock these things that are holding people back. Well, let's dig into those uh, frictions. Um, I mean, you, you categorize, you have a kind of ontology of frictions, right? With four, four buckets, um, you have inertia and effort and emotion and reactance. And, you know, I think you start with inertia probably for good reason, because we do see this status quo bias um, at the Haas school where I teach the first defining principle is, is question the, the status quo. And, um, you know, if you're an innovator, you, you, you sort of think, well, yeah, of course, right. Of course, isn't that what everybody wants to do, right. It, it, you know, being bold and, and, uh, you know, pursuing the new, but, but, you know, innovators systematically as a matter of course, underestimate the power of status quo bias. So, you know, where does this come from psychologically, right? Why, why is it that we, I mean, I, I guess you could understand evolutionarily, like, you know, bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. You know, once you stumble on something that seems to work, you, you, you know, you just kind of rinse, wash, repeat, but, but is it, is it deeper than that? Like, is it, is it, is it something which is, um, you know, why is it so difficult to dislodge this, this status quo bias that people have? Yeah. I mean, it, well, it's, it, yeah. Uh, I, you know, first I would just reinforce that, that, that essential point, which is it tends to be so much more robust than people, uh, realize it tends to operate it affect us. I think in ways that people don't perceive because this, what we would call inertia status quo bias, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's not just about do I accept or reject the new idea? Because even if you get people to accept that a change needs to occur, even what we will consider yeah. is what's on the table. Like what are the possible paths that are even in the considerations set? Generally, those are deeply shaped by our familiarity with them, right? So it's, it's not just constraining, do, are we open to change? Even if we take that step into change, um, uh, perfect example of this uh, is that you'll know too. Uh, you know, our group, as it occasionally does, our, my department was thinking about ways like what should our PhD training look like, and if you mm -hmm. and people have their very different ideas about that, and if you really explore where their idea comes from, it is invariably because it's how they were trained. Like pretty much the yeah. model of PhD training that everyone endorses is their own experience. Um, but I don't think they, yeah, we, we, we took a, took a long, t it took a long time for us to kind of overhaul econometrics and add in kind of data science elements, right? It took, took a really long time and, you know, and it was primarily just because it was a little bit unfamiliar, uh, to most of the faculty members. Yeah. Um, a, a light example of this, uh, I'll ask. Uh, often students, people, um, so what's the music that you grew up with? You know, so for me, mm -hmm. I'm 43. Uh, so this would be like Nirvana would probably sit front and center that like nineties grunge music. That was the kind of music of my generation. Um, and, and then I asked them to define, identify the music of the generation before and after, and then list, uh, which, which of those three things, which is your favorite? and which is objectively best. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, n not surprisingly, it's like, I mean, it varies a little, but it's overwhelmingly people like their own generation of music over mm -hmm. those that came before and after. But with equal strength, they think that music is objectively superior. Um, and it's so much of this, like so much of our preferences are simply just shaped through familiarity. And that is- it, Yeah, I mean, in this, in the last Super Bowl, I had a lot of friends who were saying, like, finally, they've got good music during halftime. And I was like, no, it's just that finally you're old. You right. <laughs> like, it's, a, it's a perfect example. Because they play old people music, right, in the in the Super Bowl, right? It's a perfect example. They were playing ninety primarily 90s hip-hop. And so people who grew up with that music love that music because it's what they know, right? And that, of course, that's why you said it's, for Haas, it's a starting principle because that's an ever-present friction against change because you're trying to get people to break away from what is known, what is comfortable, what is familiar. 
And our general way we do that is just urgency, excitement, appeal. I mean, I think why, um, I don't know that I can do much better than the kind of evolutionary arguments that you've put forward. And the, the way I would, the way I kind of naturally think about that is to, you know, imagine you're on a deserted island and you see two kinds of fruit trees and one is banana trees, like a little different than the store, um, but it's clearly banana. And then something else, exotic, orange, spiky, green flesh with an unfamiliar smell. You know, which of those are you going to try if they were both in full abundance? I mean, the answer for most people is pretty clear, right? You're going to go with what you know. And evolutionary arguments are can be compelling in some ways and dissatisfying in others. But it does resonate with me, this notion that familiarity signals survival with previous encounters and shifts our preference in that direction. And um, so uh, w whether that's ultimately a satisfying explanation or not, I think what what is mm -hmm. undeniable is how powerful it is in shaping what we do, if I may, with an, because I think it's such a fun example, is thinking about, about, I like to get people's attentions by pointing out that Americans are socialists and Europeans are capitalists <laughs> as it pertains to football. American and European right. football, right? right? Because Amer <laughs> th the mm -hmm. NFL is like a Scandinavian's dream. There's the tr the 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 lowest performers get the most resources. Like the, everything is mm -hmm. focused on creating a level playing field. There's profit sharing. the 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 LA and New York teams have the same budget as the team from Green mm -hmm. Bay, and uh, right. it could not be more different than you know the landscape in european football real madrid manchester united chelsea I mean, they oftentimes those teams will have one, one player that makes more than the lower level squad in in total mm -hmm. um and of course all of this is a bit funny because the political preference preferences and landscape are the mirror opposite and if you ask people if you were to ask americans hey do you want that do you want a league that looks more like European football? The vast majority would say no and vice versa. And, you know, why is that? Well, it's not so much because we're defending the system because it's a better system. We're defending the system because it's the system that we know. And it just kind of roots mm -hmm. us in that. And think of, I think, baseball. Think, you know, you have a, a organization that is rooted in tradition. Right, that's a real deep kind of inertia because now any kind of, you know, my, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but I follow baseball and I get the sense that it doesn't have the momentum and prominence that it may have once had. But ideas to change the game, that's a very difficult proposition for baseball because it is so rooted in this legacy. And I think what's a really interesting thing to think about is, you know, are there, what are the, the kind of intuitive ways we try and break down problems like that? And are there some better, better ways for, um, seeing products, organizations evolve into a better form? Well, you also liken homophily to a uh, kind of a, a type of status quo bias, right? Where you know, we, we like the familiar faces. We like the folks that we, you know, uh, can identify with. And, and you talk about, uh, networking, right? I mean, we, we would have at, at my school, we have these big networking events, uh, bringing together all the alums from the entire, you know, last 30 years, they all come together and what do they do? They hang out with the, the, their classmates, right? They, they don't, they don't go and talk to the folks, you know, even like two years ahead of them because uh, they, they just, uh, it's a little intimidating, right? So, so, you know, doing the tried and true, hanging out with the people that you, you know, you know. And, and so you talk about a lot of ways that you can um, kind of leverage status quo bias, right? Or you can kind of trick people into, I mean, I don't want to use the word trick, but 
you know, overcome this status quo bias, maybe by creating some familiarity. I mean, you, you, you referenced the, the well-known, you know, mere exposure effect, which every time I, every time I hear about it, I, I'm still kind of perplexed that, that, you know, this would work, but it, it does seem to, it does seem to work, right. Getting people more, um, just exposed to something makes it more likely that they're going to kind of accept it. Um, so what are some of the techniques that we can use to kind of, um, overcome status quo bias? Yeah. Um, there are, there are a few, um, to, to, uh, pick up on your last point, um, let's say the first is, uh, do not underestimate the people's capacity to acclimate. Uh, you know, the person mm -hmm. that moves from Florida to Minnesota, their first winter is dreadful and they believe they will never adjust to it, but they will. I, I, I've spent time in Minnesota and I lived there for a few years. And by the time I came back to Chicago, Chicago winter had nothing on me. You know, there was no fright. There was no concern. I barely needed a coat because that's how much I had. My understanding of what cold is had been shaped by being in a significantly uh, qualitatively colder environment. Like humans acclimate to things, but they need uh -huh. time to acclimate. And I would but they don't, they don't seem what, to be good at, they can't predict. I mean, so this is a question of hedonic forecasting, right? So people tend to, you know, they, the, something looks super, super intimidating ex ante, but then ex post, it's like, okay, well, no big deal. Yeah. And we tend to, uh, uh, so what I'm trying to draw attention to in part is what I would consider a, a number of just intuitions around, um, creating change that just don't serve us well. And I think a useful way to think about this is to, you know, for listeners to think back to the very first sip of beer, wine, any alcohol that they've had. And for the vast majority of people, uh, the first sip of alcohol is an unpleasant experience. And that is because it is an unfamiliar experience. Like the taste of alcohol is, is a, distinct taste that they haven't encountered before. Um, and it's not, well, anything it, is, it is a neurotoxin. Yes. Yeah. When we're not wired, you know, it's not like sugar, it's not like fat. Um, but that thing that, that neurotoxin, that thing that was, re, re, um, repulsive to, to people very quickly, not only do people come to, um, tolerate, like I've, you know, an IPA at the end of the workday is something I very much look forward to. And my first experience was not that way. Um, and I think in, now imagine if the alcohol industry followed this path where they allowed people to try alcohol for the very first time. And then right there in that moment, you had to endorse it or reject it. Um, but I would argue that this is what uh, organizations in particular, leaders in particular, that's the the environment they create very often where they see a problem. Uh, maybe it's uh, executive level team has identified some uh, impending challenge. They go out and find a solution. They then vet the solution. They, th that small group of people get excited about that solution. And then they unveil it on people. And believe that because they see the wisdom in it, people will immediately embrace this idea and then become astonished when they don't. And often the lessons they learn are, you know, people around here can't be trusted to, you know, see the valuable path and et cetera. Well, we, part of the issue is people simply need some time. Now, a self-evidently terrible idea time will entrench those beliefs but mm -hmm. often a lot when you when you drop an idea on people and then expect them to embrace that idea very quickly you are catching them at a moment where resistance is often going to be most acute because it's the moment uh, in which this idea is most unfamiliar and so w there are a number of remedies but often uh, i think a a 
simple and therefore deceivingly, uh, surprisingly powerful approach can be give people some time and repetition. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought our, uh, I would give Northwestern a lot of credit for how it handled mask mandates and where it nothing came quickly and there was a lot of repeated communication of what what may be like we are exploring this issue then a couple we are continuing to i think it was about the fifth the fifth communication was one that we're actually doing this and my guess is mm -hmm. had they skipped all of those first four communications they would have gotten a much different response uh and this i find is a if, if for people looking for very kind of tactical, tangible ideas, I think one, a simple one might be it, if don't pitch an idea in a meeting and it, look for buy-in, pitch that, bring up the idea and let people mm. acclimate to the idea. Even if they reject it now, take that as not no forever, just know in this moment because it's the first time they're hearing this idea. And maybe think about bringing it up again a second time. And it's not until a few of these encounters that you might really try and get the idea implemented because now this idea has sat with them. And it gets back, the data hasn't changed, the numbers haven't changed, the arguments haven't changed, mm -hmm. but for the, for, for the person, it's now a familiar thing rather than an unfamiliar thing. You mentioned that uh, in your class you would um, ask something at the beginning of class, say, at the end of class, I'm going to ask you this, and you get a much better response than if you just kind of spring it on them, like, right at the end of class, right? Yeah, yeah. so a simple way, um, it can, so there's a, here's how this assignment is structured in the syllabus, and then I propose a break from the status quo. And, you know, it's set up, I, I'm setting this up to let the effect breathe, like, th there's, it's not like, do you want free ice cream, right? There's, there, there are trade-offs and there's ambiguity, but if you, but if you pose, if I pose the idea and say, all right, if you want to change, if you like this idea, raise your hand, or I pose it at the beginning of the three hour lecture and then tell them, I'm going to ask you at the end. And that ask at the end is important because time is repetition because now, you know, in their while you know while i'm lecturing and their mind wandering uh this idea is is kicking around in their head and so by the time you get to the end they've you know there's been a lot of repetition and um you'll see much less resistance to it at that moment and that's just this sort of simple intervention now again this is not i'm designing that to work maximally well right it's not like a self-evidently bad idea is going to win people over just because you give them more time. Um, you know, I want to make sure all of this is rooted in what in in mm -hmm. realism. And in fact, I think that is encouraging for using techniques like this because um, what we're not doing is deceiving people to embrace bad ideas. What we're doing is breaking down these what are gen often irrational forces that hold people back from embracing good ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, you also talk about the use of, of analogies and you talk about kind of, you know, introducing extremes in order to, um, you know, create a new perspective on things. And I like the example when you were, um, your department was thinking about hiring someone with a neuroscience uh, background, right? How you, you were able to kind of position that as being, you know, less of a, um, less of a strange thing and something that, you know, kind of made sense compared to the alternative. Uh, maybe you could talk about, you know, talk about that and, and how, you know, how you can kind of position things, right? It's kind of like half full versus half empty, just changing the, the way, the perspective that people take in order to make things look more familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you were trying to get people to embrace the, the innovative idea, if you're trying to get people to break from the status quo, so well, one technique would be time and time and repetition. Uh, another would be to kind of shrink the change down. Uh, so if what you're mm -hmm. pursuing is transformational things, I wouldn't really, I would probably drop the label transformational. Um, but this third technique, it's what I would call um, the relativity principle, the relativity technique. 
uh, is really one of my, my favorite influence principles. Uh, and it's the idea that, uh, so in most cases, if we're trying to sell people on an idea, the intuitive approach we follow, you know, you as the innovator, you as the leader, you identify the thing you want people to do. Um, so if I want people to start using this new product, I'm holding up a phone for those listening. What I'm going to do is put this in front of you and I'm going to begin to elevate the, the benefits, sell you on this thing. Um, notice, so we understand the world fundamentally in relative terms. We understand the world in relative terms. You know, if you think about, you know, listeners, if you think about, so if I were to ask you on a scale of one to five, five being high, you know, how funny are you? Uh, one to five, how good a dancer are you? Uh, one to five, how creative are you? Notice you don't and you cannot answer that those questions in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Like implicitly, intuitively, what we're really doing is we're saying, well, where do I stand relative to others, to the people I've met? Like at a at a wedding when the when the dance music goes on, what is my reaction like relative to people around me? Like we understand the world in relative terms. And this has huge implications for innovation, getting people to embrace change, though uh, uh, we often don't see it. Because when I put this new thing in front of you, there is an implicit point of comparison. It's what's known, what's comfortable, what's familiar. So if I'm going to my group and say, I think we need to make a, maybe it's data science. We need to invest in, in a data scientist. Now, I know we've never done this before, but here are all the benefits of a data scientist. Well, what is everyone in the room at some level going to be comparing? They're not thinking about data scientists in a vacuum. They're comparing it to traditional hires. And what people might notice is that that's, for me, the innovator, uh, a problematic point of comparison. Because now the people in the room are wondering, what do I prefer? The kinds of hires that are known, that are comfortable, that are familiar, probably a short list of candidates I know personally, or would I uh, prefer to hire in this new, exciting, but also un totally unfamiliar field? Uh, that's, that's a friction working against me, quite likely. Um, so a good rule of thumb for people is anytime you're offering them one path, like you're putting one thing up in front of them, uh, it's a good chance that the status quo is operating against you. Now, the better news is that once you see that, there are all kinds of ways to not only reduce that friction, but to take that thing and transform it, in essence, into fuel to make it a motivating force. So I'd say that the good rule of thumb is don't give people one option because they compare the new thing to the familiar thing. Um, instead, create several options. Now, I'm talking from an ethic. I'm not talking about invented. I hate the kind of faux scarcity uh, invented options. But well, I, I worked at a restaurant where we had a yeah. we had a decoy wine that was not that we didn't actually have it. It was it was it was fake. So if anybody ever asked for the decoy wine, we, we had to say, "Oh, it's out, out of stock." Yeah. See, and that's such a that's such a I love that example. It's also from the restaurant, such a clumsy execution, right? Because there's absolutely no reason to operate in, uh, from that position. Of, I know. Cause if somebody, somebody actually, actually ordered, ordered it, it, it would be, it would be, you know, it would make yeah. so much money. We should, we should have had it. You should have that line. But what it speaks to is for the innovator. I think there's this instinct that we often put forward good, but realistic options. So like the thing that the innovator brings to the table, like the change initiative, the, there's an ideal version, but they hide the ideal because they fear it's asking for mm. too much. So what they'll put forward mm. is a very good, it's a win, but in a realistic option and, and a nice way to, to leverage relativity uh, in ways to promote innovation uh, instead is never remove that ideal because if I put, and it just, it works precisely like the wine example, right? So the wine example is 
if you want people to buy a $50 bottle of wine, you should have a hundred, a $150 bottle of wine on the menu. Now you should really have it there. So you can, uh, give it in the moments it's offered, but we don't walk around with a constructed understanding of what we'll spend on wine. We understand it in context. So, uh, the 150 bottle fundamentally changes our understanding of the 40 and 50. It makes it look mm -hmm. more accessible, more familiar, more comfortable. And I think there's great parallels uh, for creating change, whether it's social change, whether it's policy, uh, whether it's internal initiatives, where uh, anytime you remove that idealistic thing, that's a, um, that is generally a missed opportunity because mm -hmm. leaving that in is in the choice set will change the way they understand anything that comes um, below it. And the same is true. W one other sort of technique for leveraging relativity. Uh, the other, I think, faulty intuition, influence intuition we have is you as the innovator, you see the problem, then you begin exploring potential solutions. You spot the best one, but you call, you remove the other possible but inferior solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons you're so excited about your idea, your uh, decided path, is because you see it in context, right? Like you see that there were four s potential solutions while one is better than these other three. Part of your excitement is because you understand it in relative context, but we, what we often do to simplify the message is we pull away all of those inferior choices and just give people one thing. So now, again, they're comparing, do I want to do the new unfamiliar thing or do I want to do what's known and comfortable? And uh, another piece of advice to, uh, might be to use inferior options uh, as points of reference. Now, again, and I'm not talking about inventing inferior, I'm not talking about distorting people's perceptions. I would argue that what you, in fact you're doing here um, is you're allowing people to make more informed decisions because they're seeing the broader, you might say, look, there, there were, you know, we need to work with a, this, a service provider. Um, and there are four out there and we took a close look at all of them. And, and I think you'll see there's a clear winner, but here's why we're excited because here are some of the issues with these other ones. Now people aren't just focused on, do we change or not change? Now we're shifting more attention on which of these innovative ideas seem best. And that I would argue is generally going to be a, a better uh, uh, context to allow new ideas to flourish. Now, of course, um, a lot of companies understand the attraction of, say, a, a freemium business model, right? Where, you know, you make it super easy. You, you kind of eliminate all the objections to at least kind of trying the product. And then once you start trying it, then it becomes more familiar and then you are more willing to kind of, you know, upgrade it. And, and I think this, this kind of segues into, right, the um, effort piece, right? So, you know, how do you build a roadmap or, you know, I think you, you use the term kind of, you know, a ladder, how do you create a ladder that, 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 that kind of allows people to adopt the idea uh, almost, um, effortlessly, right, through a couple of, of easy steps and, and, and sequences rather than kind of, you know, swallowing the, the entire, you know, antelope in, in, one, in, one, uh, in one gulp. Yeah. So this, so if you think about why people say no, uh, you know, uh, this friction, this principle uh, excites me quite a lot because I, I would argue uh, effort is if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest forces operating on our behavior. But it's one that I think we are shockingly neglectful of when we're trying to design uh, change. And now I think there's reasons for that. We often don't, we know it's sort of, we don't put a effort as the reason for our resistance very often because it doesn't seem like a professional reason to reject um, a, an idea. But uh, I come back to again and again, very often people are doing an effort calculation. And so one of the really fun examples of this is, but I think captures efforts implication for the innovator um, is we'll, we've asked people, okay, uh, 
sort of field experiment style. Hey, could have, can we have five minutes of your time? Basically, we're asking them to fill out a survey and we use some fuel to get them to say yes. And in one case, we say um, this five minute survey, if you do it, we'll give money to the local dog shelter. Uh, in the other case, we'll give money to the Chicago Herpetological Society, um, which herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, and if you could see this room more, you would see that there's a, a giant tortoise in here. Um, I'm a member of the Chicago Herpetological Society, but <laughs> for most people, like what do people care more about dogs or frogs? Overwhelmingly dogs. Uh, so not surprisingly, the rate of yes is much higher when the ask is for dogs rather than frogs. And that demonstrates the value of fuel, right? The, the dog shelter is more attractive, so they're more likely to say yes. But then we switch things around in another case where it, it's now a 20-minute ask. Same deal, but it's no longer a five-minute ask. It's a 20-minute ask. And we're catching people as they're going into work. And now the rates go down, but they almost all go down to, it's like one is a very quick sidebar. A thing I've learned from this journey is there's about an eight to 9% of the population who say yes to everything, just no matter what it is, <laughs> it's what I call chronically compliant. And so it looks other than those people, everyone rejects this offer. And if you were to look at it, you would say, oh, I guess these people don't care more about dogs than frogs. Well, obviously that's not what's happening. It's just that you, no one has that slack in their commute. No one can give me 20 minutes. So it, it, I could be saving children's lives. Like it hardly would matter the value of the offer. It's what people are sensitive to is the cost of action, right? And we can create, and that's to me is such an exciting missed opportunity is we think so much about the benefits of the offering but we don't think about how to make yeah. the idea more aerodynamic. And, you know, the easiest way to think about that is just like, can you make it lighter? Can you remove the steps? I think, and that's very important. I think a, another way to think about effort is ambiguity. So much of what looks like resistance is really ambiguity. People just, like, if, if, if you were to say, uh, I'll hear, I hear deans, you probably hear, I'm sure at Haas too, occasionally, we need more course innovation. Well, how do you do that? Like, wh where do I get the form? Who do I talk to? I bet most people at Kellogg, most faculty at Haas don't have that roadmap in their head. And so if you have to, if they have to do a 30, you know, page report, if you make, move it to five pages, I bet they would be astonished by how much more innovation they would see. But even beyond just making mm -hmm. the form easier, just do people know what the steps are? Because so much of mm -hmm. uh, what we allow people to do is figure it out on their own. It's trial and error. That It may be very easy, but if they don't know how to do it, they're not going to do it. And I love this example of um, there's a... In ex I do a lot of exec ed, and when I pose like what what are the what are your problems? You hear silo, we are siloed. That comes up again and again. And another is lack of innovation. And the exercise we like to do, um, I'll, I'll pose the question: So when in the week does innovation happen? Is that a Tuesday morning activity? You know, like when <laughs> when does if it requires people coming together, like who initiates that meeting, what's the meeting space, like just, and very quickly what people see is there's no roadmap to the thing they say is most important for it to actually happen. And a nice in, in, inspirational counterpoint would be um, uh, the software uh, firm Atlassian, the Australian company, where they have, or at least had, this beautiful cultural ritual called the FedEx Day, and the idea is um, if FedEx Day, because you're locked in overnight, you have 24 hours to deliver an idea. But the basic idea is teams are formed and you have one goal, which is to come up with a new idea and it can't be related to anything you're working on. And the beautiful thing about that is if you are in this business of software creation, I'm sure every one of their competitors holds innovation up as a, 
you know, as a core value, right? You would have to, but they don't just hope for it. They don't implore, like wring their hand. You know, that's all fuel. They, cr they create an environment. They create a window of opportunity for the beha behavior to happen. And I'm guessing there are very few employees who, when executives talk about breaking down silos or innovation or these, I bet there are very few people who say, well, that's a dumb idea. Uh, but what yeah. I think is really going on is in the busyness of their day, they often just don't know what it looks like, how should it happen, who should initiate. And I think it's it's such a, I think there's so much value in creating paths of action. And so many of the things that haven't have been struggling to take flight, I think can often really be achieved if we just make action easier. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, there's physical effort, right? You know, like just reaching around and grabbing the candy, so to speak, famous experiments. But, you know, cognitive effort is really probably the, the biggest um, obstacle here. And and you talk about kind of empathy and failure to understand others. But, but you also mentioned that this is really a failure to understand ourselves, right? We tend to underestimate the degree to which, right, uh, inertia and effort get in the way of our accomplishing our goals, right? So, you know, it, it, you know, Voltaire famously said that, you know, if you had to kind of go out of your way to save a hundred people in China, but you probably wouldn't go too far out of your way. But what's astonishing is that we also don't go too far out of our way to do things that are incredibly beneficial to ourselves, right? I mean, it's, it's not just simply a failure to understand others and a failure to want to improve a lot of others, but we, we, you know, effort this, this, aversion to effort is so overwhelming and we fail to appreciate it even in ourselves that, um, you know, a little bit of metacognition could go a long way in this, in this space. Yeah. Right. And, it, it, I, I had a, a recent example of this. Someone, someone, I don't know, just wrote in uh, reacting to the book and, and the way it informed, uh, he and his wife sat down and really talked about, they were thinking about moving, finding a new place to live. And, their realization, so their favorite activity is hiking. And they used to hike all the time. And now they don't hike so much anymore. And what they realized is in the, the first home where they began this kind of almost ritual, when they became and were habitual hikers, it's because the hiking trails they could get to from their house. Right. They could step out the door uh -huh. and just go for yeah. the run and be on the hiking trail. And then they moved about 15 minutes away. I mean, it's not, you yeah. know, you may be doing an hour long. It's hike. not huge. It's not huge. And in their minds, what they imagined is, oh, well, we'll just get in the car, drive to the, to the lot, and then do the same mm -hmm. things that we've always done. And the moment they made that change, you know, it would be this, it became, it just stopped happening. And if it did happen, and, and they would even say, what's funny is when we would do it, 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 we immediately remembered how much we enjoyed it and why, and there would be all of these sort of uh, commitments, verbal commitments. Okay, we got to get back into our routine. And their insight was for the next home's got to be near the, the trailhead because mm -hmm. ultimately what that, that space of, because it's not just the five, 10 minutes, you know, it's like getting in the car, maybe the cars, it's like all of those little steps yeah. have such a, big impact on what we ultimately do. Yeah. One example I like is, um, you know, I know all these people are really into crypto and they're like, crypto is great because it's decentralized and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's secure and everything else. And then, you know, 99% of them, the first thing they do is they deposit it into a, a wallet, which is not decentralized. <laughs> and is, no, not, uh, it doesn't have any of the, any of the reasons why they were interested in it. And now they're just, they're just plunking it into, into, into Coinbase, which is, is kind of funny. Um, but you also talk about emotion and, and reactivity. And, and I think we, you know, we could spend a few minutes on that um, because I think this is, this is hugely uh, important. And, you know, you, you referenced the, the kind of cake mix example, the famous one. We can dig into that because it's, it's such a, it's worth, worth revisiting. Um, but also this idea of reactivity where, you know, people don't like to be told what to do, right? People don't like to be lectured at. People don't like people to, you know, to see, uh, have the word, you know, should, uh, you know, pointed at them. 
Do you think that a lot of the techniques that you're referencing, like, you know, the Cialdini techniques that, you know, as they get used more and more frequently, as kind of nudges become a thing that people start to see more and more of, that the effectiveness of these things is start to is going to start to weaken because people will be more um, kind of suspicious of, of the techniques yeah. that you're using rhetorically to kind of persuade people? Um, so the, certainly the, the, the nudge based techniques and to an outsider, what I would recommend would probably feel very similar to those. I would, I would see these techniques as somewhat different, but when it comes to those kinds of, um, nudge techniques, uh, my guess is in a lot of cases, they are going to lose their potency because they're being in you they're being used in ways that maybe that might be effective in the short term but ultimately um are going to erode people's confidence in them so uh f this kind of faux scarcity i think is a good like i don't think today i still think it works if you're really considering it but the notion of only one ticket left you know, now there, I, a savvy consumer is going to at least wonder whether that's true or not. And, and the moment you have those, the, that doubt, then I think it will uh, undermine a lot of those techniques. Now, I think they don't need to be, you know, I, I have some ethical principles that guide a lot of this. And one would be that anything you're doing is rooted in, re in reality. It's not deceptive. Um, and so if you follow that, um, I mean, others can dis distort this for you. But if everything I'm talking about is, is should be rooted, from my view, people can have whatever ethical principles they want. But when I'm working with companies, uh, it, it can't be an invented, a false signal, et cetera. Um, but... But many of the, so if we focus on emotional friction, for example, much of that is not, is not really about a nudge technique. So, so the basic idea of emotional friction is just understanding the negative emotions that get in the way. And I, I, um, uh, a personal one I identified this morning, uh, I, was at, um, I was at the gym and I've never taken a yoga class. And now that I'm in my 40s, I feel like yoga is something or stretching or I, I this is a time when I probably need to really focus on keeping limber. And this is probably the 50th time or so I've mentally committed to signing up for a yoga class. But there's something that holds me back. And I was reflecting on what that is. And it's this anxiety that I will be so bad at the yoga <laughs> poses. It's not so much a personal embarrassment, but I feel like it's going to be disruptive to what everyone else is doing. Like that everyone else is going to know how to do these poses. And I will be so incapable of doing the most basic <laughs> things that I'm going to be a distraction or impediment for everyone else. And so you're waiting for the intro to yoga class. You wanted to see like beginners welcome. You wanted to see some kind of explicit, uh, you know, invitation to someone like that, you, right? That's right. And this is, um, you know, when you're thinking about what's what's holding people back, or like how do how do we create growth around our product? You know, our instinct is to think so much about how do we amplify its appeal, and often when we do that. Um, that kind of fuel can create its own frictions, you know? So if I see advanced, yeah. if I see credentials, if, like all of that is for a few people is amplifying the value, but for me, it's amplifying the friction. And, you know, one of the, so we, we talked about like design thinking, you know, one of the, if you like the jobs to be done, uh, jobs theory work that's really, at least over at Kellogg, gaining a lot of traction is, is the notion that when we think about value, you can think about functional value, like why do you buy a winter jacket to keep you warm, but there's also social and emotional value. And, you know, how does it make me feel and what does it signal to other people? Um, you know, one of the ways we're trying to, 
advance this idea is emotional friction is kind of the mirror opposite of that. And so when we're trying to bring new ideas into the world, we might think about even unquestionably great ideas can in all kinds of ways trigger um, negative emotions, not just around the functionality of the idea itself, but also around its broader social implications. Um, and if uh, the example I like, because I think it also underscores the opportunity in seeing the emotional frictions other people don't miss is if you think about first generation online dating, which was as far as I can tell, match.com, match.com eHarmony. Well, there's a ton of emotional friction in that proposition. And what match.com wants to do is of course grow. And, um, you know, there for like something like eHarmony, it's all the, the lengthy questionnaire, that's effort. There's also though cra the crafting of the emails, like all of that stuff. Um, but today, things like Tinder, they're the second wave of online dating platforms have largely supplanted match, like match.com, as far as I can tell, is playing catch up. I'm not an expert in, the in, in that industry, but that's, I think, an accurate perception. And um, I had the, an opportunity to talk to one of these kind of second generation providers. And what his insight was, is that the problem, what they saw, the problem with Match.com is re was rejection. Like the reason people wouldn't get mm -hmm. on is they anticipated rejection or the reason they exited before they found a successful match is just the, you know, you're already sensitive to it. And now you find what you think is the perfect person according to their website and you craft this great email and then you're told you know, I don't date Republicans or progressives. I don't. And it will, often the worst thing is you don't hear anything. And what people would say is they knew both. This is a rich database of potential people. Like they knew that there were, they believed in the value of, of online dating, but the rejection pushed them off the path. And the very clever thing that Tinder, did, so they thought about, well, how do we, how do we remove that? feeling of rejection or how do we make it less acute and the solution was mutual matching so the way you know tinder works is you swipe left or what right but you're only paired with the people that you are signal initial interest in and they signal initial interest in you now of course that doesn't mean rejection can't come down the road you can still have a bad date but what you're mostly getting hit with is acceptance. Whereas in these first, what you're mostly getting hit with for a lot of people is rejection. And that to me is, speaks to the power of finding the frictions that stand in the way. And my guess is there are a lot of products, there are a lot of services that people, it's like me and yoga, they keep thinking, wow, that would be good for me. But there's the novice anxiety. There's the fear of the uninitiated. There is some, well, what will my parents say? There's some fear that holds them back. And if you can unlock that fear, that might do a whole lot more for growth than finding ways to amplify appeal. Well, you should talk to your university president, who I interviewed a couple uh, last year, uh, because he, he was talking about how, you know, they really want more kind of lower income applicants to Northwestern at the undergraduate level. And, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't think it's because they fail to appreciate the value proposition, uh, but rather that they are, um, there are frictions there and, uh, they're, they're a little puzzled on, you know, how to resolve that. Maybe you could, you could help them <laughs> with that. But, um, but the you know, last question I want to ask you is, um, you know, we do have, we do default to the status quo, but, but isn't it possible that the status quo in some organizations could be one of change, right? So, you know. When we, we in the law, sometimes we we talk about um, you know uh, status quo, and the status quo could either be you know you're doing something or you're not doing something. And if you're not doing something, then you know beginning to do something is is uh, is considered a change. But if, you know if you've always been doing something and then you stop doing it, then that can be considered a change to the status quo. So you know are there organizations 
that kind of, you know, create enough, uh, forward momentum that, you know, slowing down and, and not doing stuff be becomes, uh, something perceived as, as, as a threat. Um, is there a way, is that, is that, is that something that's conceptually possible? Is there a way that we can reorient our, our thinking so that, you know, change is the status quo? Yeah. Oh, uh, th that's a, uh, a great, a great point and a wonderful observation. Um, well, what I think, uh, I would argue that the answer, answer is yes, because we we understand things symbolically and culturally and if people embrace the idea that so this is one of the ways we think about breaking down inertia is to try and find ways in which the change we seek is consistent with our broader identity and um so if the identity that was embraced is that we are people who are by nature adaptive or our history is to be adaptive, or who we have been is adaptive, that is a, a path to making the status quo one of we are people who embrace change and new ideas. Um, there is, uh, uh, I'll say legend has it, because it's been, it's been told to me twice, so that makes it feel real. Uh, Harley <laughs> Davidson went, uh, was thinking about and is still in the process of um, uh, moving to electric bikes, right? That think of the the inertia, the emotional resist. There's a lot of forces of change operating against that. But uh, as the story has been told to me, one of the ways they really got people on board with that change is to say. I mean, this gets back to the 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 real powerful, but you know, almost kind of cliched because of like the what business are you in point um, is to say that Harley Davidson has never been about motorcycles. It's been about uh, creating like passion and movement. And it, they, mm. the, the, the big reveal was that Harley Davidson didn't begin with motorcycles. They began as bicycles and they were a mm. bicycle company. And then the motor was created. And they made this bold decision to embrace motorized bicycles. And it was presented as now this new change is just the next step in a lineage of Harley Davidson embracing new technology. And that is a way to make the new thing seem like less of like this foreign invader and more of mm -hmm. like consistent with our DNA. Interesting. I, I do some work with the wine companies and they're all trying to figure out how to convince people to, you know, drink from cans and screw tops. And, uh, you know, there's a ton of resistance around that. Uh, just like there's some resistance around online education, but, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for joining me. This is really, we barely even scratched the surface. There's just so much, uh, kind of nuggets of, of insight and, uh, you know, wealth of, of ideas. I think you could probably take each one of these little suggestions and hyperlink to a, uh, an entirely separate book. So thanks so much for joining me. This has been a real pleasure. If I make, may make a non-financial plug. So if you are looking to explore the frish, the, this whole friction fuel concept beyond the book, uh, if you go to the human element.com, we have some free tools that allow people to diagnose the friction. So thinking about whether it's inertia, effort, uh, emotion, or reactance. So uh, that website, thehumanelement.com, has a number of free tools that allow you to try and start getting comfortable with these ideas. Well, we'll be sure to put a link to that on our website, too. And I'll be Wonderful. checking it out myself. All right. Talk again soon. All right. This has been great. Thank you. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.